Hello, you are watching the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour, the place to be to learn about the latest and greatest stories on disability advocacy. Deborah Rue, welcome to the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about your voice and what you, you know, how you're going to change the world in the future with it. So thank you for the honor. Of course. So for our viewers and listeners who are not as familiar with you, let me read a little bio. So Deborah Wu is the CEO of Wu Global Communications, a technology strategic communications and digital marketing firm helping corporations strategically include people with disabilities. Deborah Wu is a recognized market influencer and advocate for the rights of persons with disabilities, a leader, a published author, a successful entrepreneur, and a fantastic mother. She has created a path to empowerment and success for those with disabilities. She is also a contributor for the Huffington Post and her catalyst for starting RGC, Wu Global Communications was her daughter, Sarah, who was born with Down syndrome. So Deborah, thank you so much again. We're so happy to have you here today, especially someone who's so accomplished and I've had decades of experience in this field. So our first question is following up what we just said last in the bio, uh, what inspired you to start your own technology firm that employs people with disabilities with the, you intentionally uh, employing more people with disabilities than able-bodied people in the firm? Well, whenever, um, when my daughter was born with Down syndrome, they the the experts the doctors they did not realize that she had down syndrome until she was four months old and so i you know got to know this baby as i was carrying her but also she was four months old and then they tell me that she has down syndrome and the 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 news was delivered to me in such and i understand why but just such a negative way you know pretty much this baby you have you know you can't trade her in for something better but it was just her life was always a tragedy and I didn't agree with that and then when I was in the banking industry for many years and I whenever my daughter got into the middle school um, she got in the sixth she was in the sixth grade in Virginia that's when we have middle school in Virginia and um, I only say that because when I was in middle school a long time ago seventh grade was middle school so but anyway sixth grade was for her and once again I started hearing of which she wouldn't be able to do. She would add no value to society. She's such a burden. And these were from the experts that were supposed to be helping us make sure that she, you know, her life had a purpose and her life had meaning. And so I started thinking, why? I, I was surprised because I did not realize that people with disabilities were so deliberately being left out of the workforce. I didn't realize that people with disabilities, if they were working, were underemployed based on the qualifications they brought to the workforce. So it was a real eye-opener for me. And I thought, well, I don't understand. Why would we treat people with disabilities differently than anyone else? I, I don't even understand, especially when the world is so inaccessible to people with different disabilities. You know, we there's so many things that we assume if we can walk and we're not using a scooter or a service animal or a cane or there's so many assumptions that are made or that are just not true, especially when we have had the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act since 1990. So but so I thought, well, I know I'm going to create a company. I'll create a technology company because I love technology and I'll employ technologists with disabilities. And so I did it. I. I grew it to a multi-million dollar business. I had so many successes and so many talented people. I also made a billion really horrible mistakes along the way. Uh, and so in 2011, I merged that company with another company and then I started Rue Global Communications in 2013. Sorry for the long answer. That was a, that was a big question. No, 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 no worries. I appreciate the passion. And uh, so as you mentioned, I know you were an executive in the banking industry prior to building your own technology firm, um, Tech Access, back in 2001, which you've since merged with another company, I know. Um, so you built Tech Access to a multi-billion dollar uh, business, as alluded to earlier. 
But what is even more amazing is that 80% of your team were technologists with disabilities. Right. So you said, you once said in an article, it was all focused on mainly helping corporations, but we also had government and university clients making sure their websites were accessible to people with disabilities. And who better to do it than the people who have those types of disabilities and who would know whether it's it's successful. At the time, very few of my competitors employed people with disabilities, unquote, quoting you there. So my question for you is, was it a challenge trying to find individuals with disabilities with the skill set that you needed? If so, how can this be improved? Because, you know, I often hear uh, employers saying they want to hire people with disabilities, but they just can't find them or right. they can't find people with disabilities with the skill sets and talents that they're looking for. Yeah, and that's a really good point and a really good question because when I and you know 2001 isn't that long ago but still when I first started doing it um many people that I hired that were technologists they um they had they were not they hadn't didn't have uh typical education experiences you know education wasn't very accessible still we have a lot of accessibility issues with education today we have a lot more people with disabilities going to um, college and graduating uh, but back in 2001 there really wasn't a lot so most of the technologists that i hired were self-taught they taught them themselves programming, they taught themselves DOS, they've taught themselves technology of all different kind of things, and and they were brilliant. They were innovators, and they were just brilliant. And I also, at the time, I was employing technologists with disabilities all over the world, mainly in the United States, but I had people um, in India and um, a couple of people in the Middle East, and because these people, these talented technologists with disabilities were all over the place. And so I didn't need them to be all located right here in Richmond, Virginia. I needed them to, you know, be available to work on technology. So we teleworked, which was also very different at the time because a lot of people weren't teleworking and telecommunicating at, um, at the time. But there was a gentleman that worked for me. He happened to live in Richmond, Virginia, but when he was um, the last day of high school, he jumped into the James River, hit the water the wrong way, and he broke his back, and he became a, a quadriplegic, oh, wow. and he he was able to breathe on his own, but other than that, you know, he, he required around-the-clock support, and so he lived in what we, it is a place here in Virginia called the Virginia home. And um, he was so smart. He unfortunately has passed away now, but this man was brilliant. And I remember back in 2002, Canon asked us to, um, if we could design the most accessible copier for people with different types of disabilities, what would that look like? And it sort of seems funny to say that because most copiers are accessible now, but they weren't then. So this quadriplegic, this man with quadriplegia in Richmond, Virginia, he sent me 15 pages of suggestions that I sent to the engineers of Canon in New York, in Washington, DC. They were so impressed with these ideas that they sent him to New York and then it got sent to Tokyo. And a lot of this man's ideas were implemented right into the copiers. And then the other copy um, companies started copying what he was doing. So that was, there was something really amazing here. And I thought, and I started winning all these awards. And everybody was patting me on the back, but really it was these brilliant people that I was getting to be high, getting hired. Um, and then, IBM, Microsoft, a few other really big companies started coming in and still in my employees offering them better money, better benefits. But I was happy, but I was sad because these people are so talented. So I often hear what you hear too, that um, we can't find the talented people with disabilities. And I just call a little BS on that because there are some very, very, very talented people with disabilities in the marketplace, but we sometimes take a look at a person with a disability and we try to fit them in the square box that we have over here. And you're totally missing the point of hiring innovative people with disabilities when you do that. And so I think there's a lot of misinformation of why this happens. I, and I have corporations saying to me sometimes, well, we'll, we'll, we'll call, call out these jobs right here 
here and they'll be just for people with disabilities. Well, people, there are a billion people with disabilities. You cannot put any of us in a box. And so I believe the people are there. If you really want to find them, look at you. You're a perfect example of a very talented woman, you know, and so I just don't buy that. I don't think they're looking in the right place. And that's why shows like yours are so important to continue to break down the barriers of what people can do if given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words there. Um, so what can employers do if they are there? Like, what do you think is the real issue there. If talent is there, the people are there, but at the same time, they're also saying that they're looking and they're trying and they're putting out all these programs to make the effort. Well, I think there, um, I, I talk about this a lot on my show, Human Potential at Work, and I hope you will honor me by coming on my show and talking about your story. But I, I talk about this a lot, and I think there's a lot of reasons why we're having these problems. And so I, I'll just give you a few things to think about. I was introducing this really amazing man. Um, he's the president of Siemens, and he was talking about they have five generations in their workforce right now. That is just unheard of. So you have people people over 75 and that's working and a lot of them are executives and a lot of them are, are actually Caucasian males and they're very the, at the very top of a corporation and then you have the baby boomers which I'm part of and the youngest baby boomer is 55 and then you go into the Gen X and you go into the millennials and now you got the Gen Z's in the workforce I would assume you might you're either a millennial or a, GZ, a Gen Z I don't know how old you are but the millennials and the Gen Zs, they're fascinating because they are not willing to work for corporations that don't want to include all of us, and they'll actually leave. They will walk out on you if you sexually abuse women and do nothing about it. 1,500 people did that at Google. So they'll strike and they'll strike out of class to make sure that the leaders understand we want climate action right now. So it's interesting watching the younger generation. So some of it is because um, we never did it before, right? So, okay, but that's not a good, that's not a good answer. Some of it is because your job descriptions are so outdated. You have somebody that's say is working in customer service and you expect that they can lift a box over their head. That's 50 pounds. What does that have to do with anything? That doesn't even make any sense. You think that you can just call out certain jobs and just put all people with disabilities in there. That's ridiculous. You can't do that. Or they haven't taken the time to understand what are we even talking about here? Um, people with disabilities are a huge group and it, it includes people with mental uh, health, mental illness. It includes people with physical disabilities, people with vi invisible and hidden disabilities like dyslexia and ADHD. And, you know, they, it's a really broad, broad community. But at the same time, I think our community is part of the problem because if our community came together and really spoke from really loud voice, nobody would be able to miss our community. Community. If we supported the community members that are deaf or hard of hearing or the people that were blind or people in wheelchairs or everything that makes us so unique and valuable as consumers and employees. Um, and if we started saying, well, I'm not going to work for a corporation that doesn't hire people with disabilities. I'm not. No, I'm not even going to consider you, um, especially if you're a talented young person with all these degrees and uh, everybody wants you refuse to work with a corporation that's not including everybody. So I think there's things both sides can do. And my newest book, Inclusion Branding, I talk about some of this. I also talk about in my book, Tapping into Hidden Human Capital. But I really like how the younger generations are really, really owning their voices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's a wonderful point. Um, I wanted to um, pick up at one of the points that you were saying about, um, I didn't realize that Gen Y's, I did hear that, you know, social enterprises are, are more valued than your traditional just bottom line business. Um, but I didn't realize Gen Z's, you were saying? Yes, the millennials and Gen Z's. Yep. Millennials and yep. Gen Z's are so so conscious of these social issues. So yes. my next question for you is, prior to your daughter, Sarah Rue, being diagnosed with Down syndrome, how did you view people with disabilities? And uh, 
if relevant, how did Sarah change your attitude? Well, you know what? I when Sarah was born with Down syndrome, I I thought that you know here my 28 year old you know girl that just gave birth to a baby and I didn't think I knew anyone with a disability. I didn't have a negative opinion of people with disabilities. I just didn't think I knew anybody with a disability. So it just was, it was sort of like when they started telling me Sarah could add no value to the workforce. And I'm like, what? So it was like, it just wasn't in my radar. And so, and you know, if you think about it, I turned 60 this year, so much has changed, right? So much technology and social media and everything and the way we communicate. And so you really could be isolated about things. And so I really did not you know, my my grandfather, as I was saying that, my grandfather was disabled at the time. My grandfather had diabetes. He had lost both of his legs. But I just didn't think I knew anybody. So I didn't know what to think. Um, I also had to walk the path of because they were actually telling me that she was broken. And so I and, and we, th there was one doctor that suggested, well, you know, some people institutionalize babies with Down syndrome, not as much now and stupid things like that. And I'm like, get away from my baby, you know, but so I just did not know anything about the community. And so then I started stepping in and trying to figure it out and realizing how diverse this community is and the nuances and sometimes the fussing and fighting that we all do. And um, even when I started my company, Tech Access, I had leaders saying, we don't need you in here. You don't have an open disability. You're not welcome. You're not, well, you're a white woman. You, you, you don't have anything to say. And I'm like, but shouldn't we all be advocating for this? Isn't this in all of our best interest to do this? Um, now, I will tell you, and you didn't ask me this question, but I will tell you that 2001 to 2019, you know, it's almost 20 years. It's a long time, especially these days. But one thing that has happened is I think is very important and that I don't speak for you or I don't speak for anybody else. I speak for myself. I have a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, but I think it's very important in that if you're going to have a panel and you're talking about people with disabilities and you don't have a person up there that has a visible disability so that we know exactly what we're talking about, I think it's a mistake. I think it's time for us to stop speaking for each other, but instead open the door for so that the um you know especially the younger generations can come in and speak for themselves uh there was um the other day on twitter i'm very active on social media you know um there was a tag and it was um it that was trending and it was white privilege and i thought oh do you have the nerve to go in there deborah because people can get real ugly on twitter and so I, they said, what are you doing with your white privilege? And I said, what I'm doing with my white privilege is I am making sure that I'm opening the door wide so that my sisters and my brothers can come in and ha have a voice because I have the ability to do that because of where I play in the world. And the United Nations has recently asked me to um, put together Women in Technology Task Force for the United States. And believe me, I want diversity in there. Diversity, and by the way, diversity will include our male allies too. So, sorry, that's a long answer. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, great points. Um, so, having done some work in the area of disability access and perception, or should I say lots of work, um, what is the biggest PR change we can make regarding people with disabilities? Great question. And I, I was actually asked a similar question, it, it, turning it a little bit the other day when I was speaking. Somebody asked me what was the biggest barriers to our community. The biggest barriers to our community is that many people with disabilities don't want to self-identify. So they don't want to really own that you're not broken. You are just this is the uniqueness of who you are. Um, and I think at the same time, that's our biggest opportunity. So the more 
we let my generation, the baby boomers and olders, we let the young people have their voices and be heard and consider that what they're saying might be really valuable to us. The more we do that, the more we allow people to take the microphone. So it's like, no, I got it. I'll speak for everybody with disability. You know, the more we really recognize that opening the doors and letting others in to speak their truth, the more we all, the we all win. So I think that you see people um, with disabilities taking to Twitter on certain hashtags and sometimes being very negative and just fed up with the way they're being treated. I think we need that. We do need that. I think that also scares the corporations, but eh, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of fear in that you have to understand we will change our business relationships if you don't treat us right or include us. But then we actually have to do that. Um, I, I talk about a story in one of my books where I was doing business with a really nice um, prescription company, pharmacy company, um, like Walgreens, and it wasn't Walgreens. But at the time, Walgreens was, and still is, they were doing a really good job of hiring people with intellectual disabilities. And my daughter has an intellectual disability. So even though I liked where I'd been shopping for 25 years, I liked it. Um, I just thought it was wrong to stay with them when I knew their competitor was doing a better job. So I switched, switched all my pharmacy, blah, blah, blah. But I also wrote a letter to both CEOs telling them why I was switching. And I talked about it on social media, I talked about it in my books. So we, as a community, we have so much more strength than we realize. And we have the power to tell our stories both negatively and positively. However, sometimes you need to be heard in whatever your style is. For sure. I think there is definitely still that negative stigma. That's why I was asking about the PR change, because I feel like the view of individuals with disability of individuals with disabilities and people's attitudes towards individuals with disabilities. Yes, it, it's changed, but the attitude yeah. is, is uh, the change is too slow. I'm not saying there's no change. I'm just saying it's very, very slow. I agree. And I also think the more that we see people like you on air, telling us your truth, speaking to others, and you're doing sort of what I've also been doing, talking about other people's stories so they can see how we're interacting and what we're learning from each other. Um, one thing that I'm saying a lot to my generation is you're making a mistake if you're not listening to the young people. You just are because it, it just sort of appears that one generation seems to be a little bit more evolved than the next generation. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's just what I see. And so I think the biggest opportunity once again is to make sure you have the microphone and your peers have the microphone and that we don't just, you know, back in my day when I was, you know, in my 20s, no, everybody discounted what I thought. I remember that. It really made me mad. And I had the, I looked younger than I was. And so at the time, I didn't like it. It's a little bit more beneficial now, but at the time I didn't like it, but I was always pretty much, it felt, I was always so discounted. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you go and be quiet, sit down. You're not old enough to have an opinion. And it was really bad. And so I think how we could make this change happen faster is if the people, the leaders like myself, the, the world leaders that are actually the ones that are being invited to the stage to have these conversations would bring somebody like you with us, right? Because I'm being talked to about speaking in the World Economic Forum in Davos. You need to be on that stage with me. So I think that's how we can change it. The ones that have the, if we call it privilege, I've worked really, really, really hard to be here. But if we open the door and let the others behind us, and by the way, if you're born in the United States, you have American privilege because you grew up in a developed country. So we all have privilege, but we still, people with disabilities, especially physical disabilities, are discounted. And if you have an invisible disability and your disability confuses somebody, maybe you act differently because of your disability, that confuses people. And then it becomes a charity or even bullying, I, I, it's, we still got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I accept, I'd be happy to go to Davos. <laughs> yes, yes, I definitely am excited about you. 
Um, so thank you. So what gives you hope when trying to achieve equal opportunity, access, respect, and dignity for people with disabilities before we go too far into the negative rabbit hole? Well, what gives me hope is that corporate brands are truly listening. I just got off the phone a few hours ago with a major brand, and they are doing everything they can to really authentically include people with disabilities. And they're just, they're really owning this. Now, the problem that they're having is that they don't know how to get their message out. So this particular brand said, well, we're going to occupational therapist, and this is one place, but they're not thinking about this as you make your products and services more accessible to people with disabilities, it really, if designed well, should improve the uh, it for everybody. Everybody should be imp it should be improved. And and I'll give you an example. My husband, it's a sad example, but I've been married to my husband uh, 37 years. And my husband, in the last year, two years, he has been diagnosed with early onset dementia, which is very scary. And my husband is. He, he's still there. He's still the man that I married and I love is still there, but I have to communicate with him differently. I can't multitask and be running past him, you know, I, but so I have to sort of slow down. But at the same time, there's certain skills he's losing. And um, there are so many people getting dementia and Alzheimer's. But what's interesting that is that what this company I was talking to that have designed the, all these really great products, those products work for someone like my husband too. So rethinking the way we look at disabilities. And I've always said the reason why I named my show Human Potential at Work is because um, you can't, you should never decide what a person can and cannot do based on some little bit of data. I believe that the reason why people with disabilities are disabled is because we don't take the time at society to design our world so that it's accessible. If you're in a wheelchair, you should be able to come in the same interest as everybody else. You should be able to go to the bathroom by yourself. It's just ridiculous what we do to people with disabilities. And then we treat them like they're little you know, I, I, you know, somebody to pet on the head and they're so cute. Oh, you're working. And, and they, we discount them as human beings. And it's all about charity. And I say to corporations all the time, throw your, you know, if you want to do charity, charity's great. But if you think including people with disabilities is just about charity, you're missing the boat because hiring people with disabilities is about being innovative because what is your life like if the whole time you're trying to get, you know, do a little shopping or go to a pharmacy or go to the movies. It's an obstacle course. Think how much your brain has had to work to be innovative. You are a problem solver. These are the kind of employees these businesses need, but they still, they still, they don't understand that yet. I'm doing my best and so are others to, to help them understand why it's so valuable, but it, it's, it's still a, in progress. <laughs> Yeah. Um, sorry to hear that about your husband. My yeah. my grandma had Alzheimer's, so I can relate to some degree. Um, yeah. And in regards to, you're right, I feel like for me, being in a manual wheelchair, I'm adapting all the time. The, the place that I live in right now, the stall, the doors don't close, so I have to use the restroom with the, with the door open. Right. Um, and, and think about Think about it. Think about that. If you're not in a wheelchair, that would be ridiculous. I would be like so mad that I had to go to the bathroom with the door open. So we've got to keep telling these stories and saying, well, I'm not disabled. You have made me disabled because you do not design your restaurants and your buildings and your offices and your schools to be accessible to all of us, you know. Where's the, yeah. where's the problem? It's not people with disabilities. It is the way we're designing our society and the way we're fixing, the, retrofitting our society. And we keep doing it. We got to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think, yeah, definitely there's, we need to get our messages across. So with that, um, I know that you're an internationally renowned global keynote speaker and travel the world inspiring and advocating for 
um, governments and corporations to include people with disabilities. So what is the key to being an engaging and effective public speaker and really be able to resonate and have the audience take away that information, turn that into action? Well, what I've always done is I've just always tried to be very authentic. And I am so not perfect. I will get up on stage in front of 5,000 people and I'll forget my thought or I'll forget a word or I'll, you know, and I, I, I think audiences, they can tell when you're sincere or not. And I think also nobody likes to be scolded. So get up there and speak your truth. I find audiences are much more responsive if you're positive and you're just, instead of saying, stop treating people with disabilities bad, I just ground it with examples. And, and I'll give an example that I, I talk about um, sometimes. There is a very talented woman who is blind um, that I know that works in D.C. And so pretty much every single day she's walking to work. She's got a white cane and she's walking to work and people will stop very, very good heartedly. And they will say, can I help you? Are you lost? Do you need, are you? And she'll say, no, no, I'm, thank you so much. I've got it. I'm fine. Um, I'm just going to work. <gasps> you work. Uh, yes, I work for the government. Da, da, da. Oh, really? So it's almost stop doing that <laughs> society, you know, stop treating people with disabilities like there's some, you know, foreign object that you're looking at. But I, I think you've got to be authentic and try not to be mad when you're on stage because some people get up there with an attitude. I remember one time a woman, I was in this really big corporate meeting and there was a lot of corporations and a woman got up on the stage and she started signing. And I'm sad to say that I don't speak a lot of sign language. I just speak a little bit, very little to none. And, but she was signing and shining and she signed for, it felt like a long time. It got uncomfortable, maybe, maybe just two and a half minutes. And she's like, how'd you like that? How'd you like being left out? And I, I was taken back. And so uh, the whole, you could feel the energy in the room drop. And the woman next sitting next to me, which was from a huge corporation, she said, well, I'll never attend one of these meetings again. So it's like, if you put people in the defensive, they are not going to listen to you. But if instead you can be authentic and you can say, this is who I am and this is what I believe and this is how I want to contribute to society getting better across the board, across the world. This is who I am and own who you are. And I think if you do that, the audience, they see it, they know it, they feel your energy. I also find it's helpful to find kind eyes. I, if you can see, I, I like to find the kind eyes and talk to the kind people in the room. But um, I've been doing it so long that I, I, I'm pretty good at it. But I'm just speaking my truth and I'm just speaking other people's truth and saying, come on, does this really make sense to you? And they're like, oh, no, oh, no, this isn't. No, that doesn't make sense. All right. And not to mention, not as a threat, but most people will experience disabilities in their lifetime, definitely. It's not a threat. It's not even an insult. The reality is we're in these beautiful, fragile human bodies. Some of us might be using a wheelchair sooner than others, but stop discounting people because they're different from you. Uh, we got to stop that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, on the one hand, I feel like I, I get where that l lady who was signing on the stage is coming from. You know, there's definitely a lot of frustration. People with people who are deaf or blind are left out of a lot of information. And so they're not as aware when they do those things as well. So it's very much systemic. But I also understand how it would come off to an average person, you know, who don't really, who aren't in that sphere and aren't even intentionally trying to leave people out. And so there's that balance. So moving on here, I know one of your topic area is explaining how people with disabilities and their allies account for vast amounts of disposable income and give and gives give insights to how to approach this market and how corporations can uh, tap into that income stream. 
Why do you think corporations and businesses don't target individuals with disabilities more when marketing when marketing their products or services? So I know even at a very basic level, having traveled to five out of the seven continents, even beggars, they don't ask people with disabilities for money. Oftentimes there will be one, one, one few and far between that does. And when you go to developing countries and they're handing out, you know, candies on the bus in hopes that you'll purchase some, um, they avoid selling it to individuals with disabilities or don't toss them one. So where do you think, yeah, so following up with that question, but then again, like, where, why do you think there's that hesitance? Well, I know why the corporations aren't doing it. They are really afraid to do it wrong. And a couple of them have done it wrong and been publicly humiliated. More than a couple, quite honestly. There's been some bad things happen and maybe they deserve to get smacked. But um, I always try to look for an opportunity to learn and grow and what could you have done better with that? And so I think, um, and, and it, it's interesting because the corporations will come to the community of people with disabilities, but this is a really, this is a field. This is a field we're in and it's very complicated. It's very nuanced. There are so many people with disabilities and not all of the disability groups want to be part of this group. For example, um, and I talk about this on my show, but example, people that are deaf and hard of hearing, they don't often identify uh, as part of the disability community. Even though they are protected class members, they don't identify it. They do not consider that they have a disability. They just consider that they speak a different language. So you wouldn't say somebody that speak in Chinese or Spanish or Arabic as a disability. They just speak a different language. And that's the deaf culture is a very proud, very amazing culture. And so part of the problem is that even our, we, we all don't agree on what the definition is. And, and then you have the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was one of the first, was the first. Um, and then you have the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the definitions do differ some. And so, but it's interesting what you're saying, you know, the beggars won't ask people with disabilities because somewhere they have been told that people with disabilities are lesser than them. And I don't know what in the world that's about. That is so ridiculous. It would be like saying all people with blue eyes or brown eyes are lesser than, or you're lesser than me because your skin color, which we do, is darker or lighter. So it's just a societal thing. And I think we have to keep, we have to keep, you know, tearing it apart and saying that's ridiculous, you know, and, um, Telling the stories, I think it's about continuing to tell the stories and making sure, once again, the microphone are ha handed to people so they can speak their own truth, not just have a six-year-old white woman speaking for them. Not that I don't add value, I do, but we've got to be no more diverse in these conversations, all mm -hmm. of the conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned in one of your Huffington Post articles that as you travel globally, there are a couple of questions that you're, you've been asked frequently uh, regarding business here. So one of them is, do the litigation efforts to assure disability inclusion and accessibility in the U.S. marketplace help or hurt the community in the global efforts towards full inclusion? Or does the litigation in the U.S. cause an us versus them mentality? So, yeah. yeah. So with those questions, I want you to, you know, answer them. But also, I really found it um, illuminating the example you gave of Disney and how they were received an, an award for being so inclusive. But then again, was um, reprimanded later by a group of, I believe, blind people. Is right. that right? Yeah. 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 Both awards were blind. The, Disney was given the... Um, 
the American, sorry, my shawl's falling, the American Foundation for the Blind's highest award, uh, which is the Eagle Award for the efforts they had made to include people that were blind and vision impaired in the parks um, and on their websites and everything. And then three months later, a class action lawsuit was filed against Disney because they have not done enough to include people that are blind and vision impaired in their parks and in their... Now, I'm not even, and I don't in the book or the article, try to debate who's right or wrong, but I do want the community to understand that is confusing for corporate brands. Are we great or are we so bad that you got to sue us? So it we it, they get a lot of mixed messages from our community and um and and they don't understand the nuances of our community either as well as many people in our community don't understand the nuances of it but it, it is interesting at the same time because i've had so many people say to me you americans and i think oh gosh where are you going to go with this but you got to stop this litigation well the reality is we create laws and then we sue each other to pound those laws out. That's the way we do it. It's the way we've done it for a long time. We're probably going to do it that way for a long time, too. Um, but because of this effort, more money and effort is being spent in the United States than really any other country because so many companies are getting sued over this and they're really scared of it. And because of that, we've seen a lot of powerful accessibility going into other countries because we are holding the corporations and others accountable. And, you know, really none of the other countries, they're trying to, but they don't have the, I'm going to sue you for a hundred kajillion dollars if you don't do this, you know, that we do. And so we've caused a divide because of this, but at the same time, we've actually made the world more accessible. And we're having these really powerful conversations because of the litigation. So thank you, lawyers. So, and I think there are times when you do need to sue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good American. No, but I really, I, some of the things I hear, some of these apartments that still don't have ADA accessible apartments when it's 2019, they need to be sued. That's ridiculous. How can you not want? And by the way, you know, there are the 72 million baby boomers are now all over the age of 55 and more and more they need they have mobility issues they're needing to use scooters and wheelchairs what are y'all thinking you are throwing away money not having apartments and buildings that are fully accessible to all of us it's ridiculous mm -hmm. yeah no it definitely is um i speak just from my personal experience it's a lot harder for me to find housing cheaper more reasonable housing than my you know peers who don't have a disability a physical disability it's uh, i it's i that is i cannot fathom that i think that's illogical why would you build any i, I remember one time talking to a theme park it wasn't disney and i was talking to them and they said well how many ada boats do we need for the ride and i said well why can't all of the boats be ada compliant and they looked at me and they started laughing and I thought, OK, well, I guess that was a stupid comment. And they're like, well, you know, that's a really good point, because why not? We haven't built the boats yet. We'll just make them all accessible. Yeah. Wow. Duh. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's a matter of not not having thought about it. I mean, when it when if you don't have a disability or if you're not that color, if you're not that sexual orientation, I suppose you don't people don't generally go out of their way to learn about that perspective. So, so last question is, so what must a company do to effectively include people with disabilities in business? So, so following up from what you were saying earlier. Well, I think that what you want to do is you really need to do your homework and make sure you get a strategist that understands that this is not just about one person. You got to bring the community and you got to know the nuances and take the time to create employee resource groups that include people with disabilities and employ people with disabilities. Be innovative. And so I think you really have to take the time 
to find the leaders, and it's not that hard to find people that are talking about this, and then track what they are saying to see whether or not that works with your company culture. Because, you know, I've had clients before that, uh, I have one client, a Japanese client, and they don't like bragging about themselves. Their culture is just, and I'm like, you're not bragging about yourself. Let me brag about you. But it's just different, right? And so take the time to really find the leaders that understand the nuances, but make sure it's diverse. Don't just hire one person. Come up with a plan and then work the plan. And I talk about that a lot in my books. Follow the plan. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, that was that was the last question. So thank you so much, Deborah. We've You're- learned a great deal from you today. Well, I appreciate your voice and I look forward to um, having you on my show and we'll make sure that we send your followers a link so that they can hear you being interviewed because you'll do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Deborah and I would love to hear from you. What digital platform do you want to see made more accessible? What information do you want to obtain out there but are not currently accessible for your specific disability? Like this video? If so, please share with your friends and follow us on social media. And if you want even more updates, feel free to subscribe to our email updates. Keep learning new perspectives, keep being inclusive, because that will make the world a better place for you and everyone else. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you on another episode of the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour.